You know, I don't know for sure right now, Kevin. I mean, I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of information gathering and clearly there's, you know, the board members uh, have questions and concerns. There's no doubt about it and rightfully so. Um, and you've heard those at our many meetings that we've had, you know, and the disagreements. So, you know, unfortunately, um, this whole process has been so challenging because we don't have that blueprint about what the right answer is um, for this. And so if I were um, uh, going to quote the late great Freddie Mercury, I would say this has definitely been no better roses and no pleasure cruise. Um, but, uh, you know, we were all trying to do what's best for our kids. You know, we know some of the legislation that's in Frankfurt that kind of sets the, the floor of returning to school. Um, and so we're cognizant of that as well. So I can't say for sure what the vote will be tonight, but, um, you know, once again, I'll present the plan, the recommendation, and we'll see where that goes. Then one more, uh, follow up on, <clears throat> did you share this reopening plan with any, uh, teachers groups or anything like that? I know I, I heard from some who were questioning why they were supposed to watch a news newscast in the middle of the workday about your recommendation. So have you shared that with them and, and you know, uh, why or why not? Well, we've shared it with all, you know, with our, um, groups that we collaborate with. So we've talked a lot with JCTA and then the CRCs, which are at the school and the DCRCs, um, you know, that was all a part of the discussion. And obviously since October 1st, we've had 11 board meetings talking about uh, this specific plan, 11 of them. Um, and I know most of you have probably worked your way through all of those 11 with us um, and right or wrong, my plan hasn't changed much um, in the past four or five of those meetings. Kevin, I can tell you as well that um, communication was shared with our families and um, employees today as well. Kevin, do you have any more questions? Uh, did you share the, uh, the actual recommendation or did you share a link to watch the uh, newscast? Can you, can you repeat the question, Kevin? I, I, I said, did you uh, share the details of the recommendation or did you just share a link um, to the newscast? We've gotten a, a notification from, from a couple parents on that. We've shared the information with the, um, that had the details of the recommendation with the dates. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Jess Clark indicates she'd like to go next from WFPL Radio. Jess? Thanks, Renee. Um, Dr. Polio, um, under this plan, it appears middle and high school would have about eight weeks until the end of the school year. Does that sound about right to you? I believe so. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact week count, but it's, it's approximate, yes. Okay. Um, how much of that time will be devoted to standardized testing? That's a great question, Jess, and one that we don't have clarity on right now. As of last week, you know, we were hoping that and, and really thought that we would get that exemption from the United States Department of Education, which did not come through. Um, so we are still, we'll be waiting for information from the Kentucky Department of Education um, and so, you know, our goal will be to have our students engaged in meaningful learning as much as possible um, in this last eight weeks. You know, I'm concerned about the validity and reliability of the data being that we'll have some nearly 40,000 students that will be remote or, you know, in the virtual academy um, and what that will mean for testing. So I've got a lot of concerns about it. Uh, but I can't answer that until we get specific guidance from the Kentucky Department of Education. Uh, may I follow up? Okay. Um, um, why not use, so one recommendation or one suggestion made by Corey Scholl would be to have a more targeted approach. Um, why not use a more targeted approach to bring back students who are most in need, low-income students, students with disabilities, ELL students, struggling students, instead of opening it up to everyone? Um, I don't think we're going to have that option. I think it's pretty clear that, um, that the decision that we will probably have um, as of early next week, will the, the House Bill 208 will say that we must open it up for all students. Jess, did you have any additional questions? Uh, yes. 
Um, so some schools are anticipating upwards of 78% of elementary school students returning five days a week. Have you thought about putting any caps on enrollment at those schools to preserve the distance between? Yeah, that's, that's one of the most difficult things is the wide, um, I shouldn't say variety, the range of uh, students in each elementary school um, and how challenging um, that may be. And I know that's a discussion with our board members that we will continue to have. It's very challenging to put a cap on coming back to school because House Bill 208 is gonna say we have to provide in-person instruction for all students. So I think we would be violating, if that passes, we would be violating the law um, by not allowing all students to have that option. You know, I know a discussion that I've had and we continue to have is whether um, to have the um, uh, hybrid model for elementary as well. You know, my preference is that we have it for five days because I think young children need that consistency. Um, and I also think we see in a lot of studies that spread amongst smaller children, 10 and less is less than older children. Uh, but I know that's a discussion we will have because we do have some schools um, that are um, higher enrollment and higher percentage of kids who wanna come back. Yes, did you have any other follow-ups? Um, just one more, um, and then I know other people have questions as well. Um, uh, where are we with hiring bus drivers and nurses? I know those are two areas where the district has some major challenges. How many open positions are left for either of those, both of those fronts? We can get you that. I know Renee can get you an exact number. Um, I believe we had hired, don't quote me on this, about 65 more nurses that would help us um, as of earlier this week, but don't quote the exact number. I know we've had a substantial number of hires. Bus drivers, we've really been, we've brought in some new folks. We're looking to hire retired bus drivers and reduce the amount of routes that we have. And so what we found right now um, is that, that our buses are, um, not nearly as crowded as what we thought they may be going into this looking at numbers right now. And you can see those numbers um, on our PowerPoint for tonight. Um, but I think Renee can get you some specifics on that. I'll follow up with you, Jess. Uh, David Mattingly from Wave 3 had a couple of questions, Dr. Polio. Go ahead, David. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I got you. Okay, my first question is, can you provide some details on what students have lost through this experience and what they will be need to do this summer to make up for that? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're going to look at many factors into that. Um, you know, when we, we there are in school factors, we're going to weigh in on that and then some out of school factors uh, that we will weigh into that as well to target specific kids. You know, some of the in school factors that we will look at will definitely be um, grades. So we know we have some su substantial work for students to recover immediately the standards um, for the grades that um, they may have failed a class. We really want to target our seniors to make sure that we get them to graduation. Um, so that's a big part of getting back in school as well as making sure our seniors graduate. Uh, but then all of our students targeting those, we will use our some of our assessment scores. You know, we use MAP, uh, which is a, a, a pretty universal uh, indicator for reading and math. And then we can compare those students um, who may have fallen behind specifically in reading and math. So, you know, a couple things we want to offer these learning opportunities to any student that wants them. But without a doubt, we're going to have to be very intentional about the students who need it the most um, and really make sure that we open up facilities, our schools and our community facilities this summer uh, to address as many children as possible. But it will not just be this summer, it's gonna have to be multiple years um, to make up for uh, the pandemic. And one other question, why only two days of in-person learning for middle and high school students? Why not more? Well, I mean, that's, that's our ideal situation is that we are five days for every single um, student in the district. I mean, that is no doubt. And, and we are flexible. And if data were to show that we could do that before the end of the year, then we would have that opportunity to do that. I find that highly unlikely, honestly, and would be targeting August for that. Um, but a couple things that, you know, House Bill 208, first of all, says that it has to be 
40% of the days offered to all students. So that is two out of five days. And then if we are going, you know, we have schools that have 2000 kids in it in high school and middle schools with over 1000 kids. Um, and so in order to increase social distancing, we really had to reduce that. Um, and this was the, the method that most school districts have gone to, which is an AB model, beginning of the week, end of the week days, and then an in-between day for deep cleaning. All right, thank you very much. All right, I don't see anyone else in the chat who's indicated that they have questions. Um, so if you do, okay, Jess has one more. And so um, for the rest of the media members who are on here, if you have a question, just let me know and I'll, I'll call on you there. Feel free. Kevin, you can ask another one too if you want. Uh, thanks, Dr. Polio and Renee. Um, for the middle and high school model, um, I'm curious how that will work for certain classes where there's only one teacher per building who's qualified or certified to teach that class. Will those teachers have to teach both a virtual group of students and an in-person group of students? And how will that work? Yeah, so being a former high school principal, there's nothing more, well, there's a lot of challenging stuff in this. I don't wanna say nothing more challenging. But one of the main challenges that we face is master schedule at all schools. So, you know, we are a district that is going above and beyond by granting um, accommodations that are required by ADA. Um, but then also, you know, we are, and you'll see those numbers, but, you know, we are going above and beyond that as well. And those who may reside with um, a high needs, uh, someone who is in a high needs group um, and many others. So that does mean that we will have a substantial number of employees working from home, teachers who will be teaching from home. So uh, you are right, when it is a English one, for instance, freshman English, a school may have six freshman English teachers and be able to then have a, some virtual sections and um, some in-person sections. But when you get into the more specific one-offs, the electives, um, that you may only have one teacher, many of those teachers will be teaching a virtual class and an in-person class as separate periods. So we are not combining them so that there is in-person and virtual going on at the same time. Um, you know, talking to other districts that have attempted that. Uh, teaching is hard enough as it is, much less adding in, you've got kids virtually and kids in person. Um, so they can have a mix of those on their schedule. Okay. Um, and, um... The other question, um, I lost my train of thought for a second. Kevin, do you have another question? <laughs> Uh, well, Kevin, we can come back to you too. Uh, Rose McBride has, has um, indicated that she has a question for you from WHAS 11. Uh, hi, Dr. Polio. I have a question about buses specifically. We have people um, messaging us saying that they're concerned. They've seen our uh, you know, coverage of the Gutenberg Elementary um, classroom setup, but what they're concerned about is buses and how students are going to be able to socially distance on those. You would mentioned that there weren't as many riders as you had anticipated. Is that just a result of only right now? I know Mark told me on Monday, 60% of students indicated they want to come back, but um, I guess, can you speak a little bit to the transportation plan? Yeah, the majority of our students do ride the bus to school, not all, but the majority do. Um, so when you take nearly 40,000 students out of the equation, obviously that makes it much smaller. Um, so right now our buses, I believe the average and um, make sure to get these exact numbers from the PowerPoint is about 22 on a bus, right in that range, um, which means it would be one per seat. And then there are some, you know, buses that are smaller than that. And we do have some larger, but the, the highest we have on a bus right now is 44. Um, which is two to a seat, but it's not three to a seat. Um, and we can have some social distance there. And obviously with mask wearing, um, that is approved by the Kentucky Department of Education. Rose, did you have another question? Nope, that's it, thank you. Okay. All right, uh, I'll go back to Kevin Wheatley if no one else has any other questions yet. Um, Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, uh, with the... Um you know, with the, with the broadcast on WLKY, I'm curious on, you know, if there was any sort of, you know, did JCPS have to pay for that airtime? I mean, what, what was the, can you provide the details of that arrangement? Um, yeah, I'd have to get that over to Renee. We start the planning um, for 
this about six months in advance. So this was really started discussion and, and scheduled about six months ago, but specific platform, I'll have to give it to Renee. Yeah, Kevin, so yes, this was planned several months ago. Um, this was, there was uh, no money exchange or anything like that, but this was something that was planned several months ago um, to broadcast this day of the district. And we went this route um, because we typically have this event in person and we have it in a ballroom with hundreds of people. And due to COVID safety procedures, um, we knew we couldn't do that this year. So we went a different route um, to make the, sure the information could still be available and accessible to everyone. Thanks. All right, I see uh, James Thomas from Wave 3 has a question. James? Hi, Renee. Hi, Dr. Polio. I was looking Hi. over the PowerPoint and I noticed that uh, people aren't supposed to put their kids on if they've got a temperature over 100.4, I think it was. How concerned are you that desperate parents and guardians are going to go ahead and stick kids on buses that may, maybe shouldn't be on there? Um, well, I think in the seriousness of the situation, I hope that's not the case. We are actually providing um, thermometers for any family who needs that. Um, they can get that through their, their Frisky at their school, and that's how we're working to, to help families with that. So um, I hope that doesn't happen, but obviously we will find out shortly after uh, the bus ride is over because they will be getting to the school and we will be taking their temperature before they walk in the school door. So we would identify that right away. And then obviously with the signed seats on the bus, be able to contact Trace pretty quickly. James, did you have another question? No, ma'am, thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, Jess Clark has a follow-up, Dr. Polio. Um, can you tell me how much, we've been talking a lot, a lot about the in-person option, how much will the virtual option change as a result of this? Um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's another, part, Jess, that isn't easy of this, um, you know, because we have so many moving parts with teachers. Uh, but what we anticipate is it will be very similar to NTI. Um, and so, you know, that's what we want parents to know. Some parents asked us, would this be, you know, six hours of screen time, just like is at school, but they're sitting in front of screen, and that is not necessarily the case at all. Uh, so it will be a combination just like NTI of synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, so that's why we say it will reflect in many ways NTI as it is right now. And that, that's a parent's choice to stay in that. All right. But yeah. Olivia, what you got, Olivia? Um, I don't actually have too much. Just took both of mine and typed question in the chat box a lot faster. Um, do you have a quick question? There were some mentions of bringing in those transition grades. So freshmen in high school, for example, bringing those students back first. Um, what happened to that? Uh, House Bill 208. Um, and so it says all students. And so for us, you know, House Bill 208, which I want to say again, hasn't passed yet, uh, but it did pass the House handily, um, which to me is a uh, predictor of, of what would happen in the Senate, but um, it says that all students must return by March 29th, which as you know, is our spring break. And so the next available or the next open school date is April 5th. Um, so it didn't give us um, leeway to bring in a transition for sixth and ninth graders um, when it came to House Bill 208. Okay, we have one more question from, oh, no, I don't have anything else. Sorry, Olivia, you, you okay? The Freddie Mercury was for you, Olivia. <laughs> yeah, I figured, I figured. <laughs> All right. Well, Olivia, if you don't have another question, we did have one more question from David Mattingly from Wave 3. Thank you. Dr. Polio, just for context, with all these moving parts in this massive endeavor, which of those moving parts has been the most difficult to coordinate and get in place for this return? Wow. Um, it's hard to even um, say which one is the hardest. So we'll start with vaccinations. Um, and so when we're talking vaccinations, we were working with Metro Health. You know, we supplied the names, but it's two large organizations um, that are trying to provide vaccinations for nearly 13,000 people two times um, over about a five or six week period. 
um, and, and really making sure we do that efficiently. Um, that, that was a huge undertaking. Um, you know, the, um, then getting into the personnel side of it and ensuring, you know, we want to support our employees, but, you know, making sure you have enough people at the school uh, to efficiently operate school um, effectively and safely. Um, and so meeting the needs of our employees and, and doing that, that master schedule at every school is so challenging how you do that um, and make sure. And then, you know, um, I'll say it again, you know, running school on a Thursday in February, running a school, I've, I did it for 10 years, is challenging enough on a regular February day without a pandemic. You put pandemic on top of it with all of the um, mitigation strategies, the mask wearing, the temperature taking, um, the hand washing, all of the, and the contact tracing, you know, all of those things are things we have never done at a school before. And the larger the district, the harder it is to do all of these. Um, and so we've been working it pretty hard um, and think we're at a, a place where we can effectively implement that. All right, anybody else? I don't so, see any other requests in the chat. Does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Folio? All right, guys. Well, thank you for your time and uh, we appreciate it. And we'll uh, see some of you later. And I know you guys will all be tuning into the board meeting tonight. So we will uh, talk to you afterwards. Thank you.